It is our pleasure to introduce to you William Tischler, who will speak to us about his chosen field, landscape architecture. Professor Tischler is a native of Door County, Wisconsin, a graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison with an advanced degree from Harvard. His research and public service have focused on historic preservation, landscape architectural history, vernacular architecture, and preservation issues relating to upper Midwest cultural landscapes. His travels have taken him far and wide, and he is now Professor Emeritus at the UW here in Madison. He is the author of over 190 publications, books, articles, including a documentary film about Jim Jensen and the clearing at Ellison Bay. He has got, been garnered numerous awards in his field and was one of the master planners of Old World Wisconsin. The biographical information I found for him would take too much time to read to you, but I found a reference from the American Association of Landscape Architects that recognized him with words that really struck me. I quote, for over 36 years, he has been a highly valued instructor and scholar. And I said to myself, he must have started when he was six years old. <laughs> Please join Vern and me in welcoming our friend, Bill Tischler. Thank you, Winnie. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. And a special welcome to all my uh, <coughs> fellow uh, exercise club members. <laughs> but you know, I was a little worried about getting here on time because um, one of my former students told me about this wonderful eight-sided barn that was being torn down way out in the western part of Iowa County. And so we decided to go to early church this morning and then drive out there. <coughs> well, I thought Betsy had put gas in the car. She thought I gassed up the car, and I did. I have. Anyway, we're going down this back road uh, way out in the wilds of Iowa County, and darn it, we didn't run out of gas. <laughs> you know, when that happens, there's usually enough uh, battery cars so you can pull off to the side of the road. So we pulled off to the side of the road, and I thought, oh my gosh, what are we going to do now? I don't, I don't think there are any filling stations nearby. A couple of cars went by, and one went by with two nuns in. <laughs> and they stopped, and the one uh, opposite the driver rolled down the window and said, uh, sir, can we give any help? And I said, oh, Sister, um, we've run out of gas. We don't even have a gas can. And she said, um, oh, I wish we could help you out. We like to do good things. But uh, we don't have a gas can either. But then the, the lady that was the nun that was driving said, hey, wait a minute, we've got a bedpan in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> they had been visiting. Um, <laughs> a place where there were senior citizens. <laughs> and uh, we can get some gas in that. And I said, oh, sister, you don't have to bother. Um, we'll take care of it. And I said, no, 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 no. We'll just go down the road. I think there is a filling station just a couple of miles uh, back. So they went off, and about 10 minutes later came back. And uh, one of the nuns uh, got out of the car, and uh, she insisted on pouring the gas in my tank. I said, sister, you don't have to do that. Leave, we can take care of that. And, oh, no, 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 sir. Uh, we like to help. So there she was, pouring gas into the tank. And another car went by, and it went past a little ways, and boy, the brake slammed on. And the guy backed up, and he rolled down his window, and he said, sister, if you can make that car run on that stuff, I'm turning Catholic. <laughs> Okay, well, um, we're speaking about one of my favorite topics, old buildings, especially ordinary old buildings, not necessarily the ones designed by architects, high-style buildings, but vernacular buildings, vernacular buildings. 
my dad was a carpenter, and quite a good one, I understand. And um, I took on an interest uh, in buildings ever since I was a young kid. And uh, there are a lot of really interesting old buildings in my hometown, Bailey's Harbor, up in, up in Door County. And a lot of old timers that knew a lot about them, too. So um, I would spend whatever spare time I had when I wasn't working <laughs> growing up um, going out and exploring for old buildings. Um, and buildings are important. Uh, remember what Winston Churchill said. We shape our buildings, and they, afterward, our buildings shape us. There are a lot of prominent uh, historians and geographers that have written about reading the landscape and how much information we can get by looking at old buildings, especially if we know what to look for. Well, we're all familiar with high-style buildings. One of America's great artists and architects, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, was a native of Wisconsin. And many of us, I'm sure, have been out to uh, his home and school, Taliesin. Frank Lloyd Wright was an interesting guy. He did get into a little trouble occasionally, because <laughs> he kept turning off with some of his clients' wives. And, um, but nonetheless, he was a, a masterful architect. But um, we're not going to look at those kinds of buildings. We would call them high-style buildings. Instead, we'll look at vernacular buildings, ordinary buildings built by ordinary people, farmers, carpenters, miners, blacksmiths, and so on. And we'll start by going way back and looking um, at our Native American friends who were the first occupants of where we now live. And they built um, shelters that were very temporary. I don't know of a single one that remains today in terms of a shelter that they built. They did, of course, construct Indian mounds, and they've been quite durable over the years. But we've literally destroyed according to a friend of mine who knows a lot about this, about 80% of them. Um, and there are some interesting formations. Uh, there's a nice big eagle mound behind Ag Hall, where I used to have my office. Well, Wisconsin is a really interesting state, I think, not only because of its landscape, but because of its people. Over some 40 different ethnic groups settled in Wisconsin during the 19th century. And they came from all over northern, central, and southern Europe. The map on the right portrays a study that was done by two professors in the Department of Rural Sociology who plotted using census data on a township by township basis the predominant ethnic group in that respective township. Now, you can see a lot of yellow on the map, so you know darn well what color that represents, right? And it would be Germans, of course, from Deutschland, right, where all my ancestors came from. And, um, you know, Wisconsin never had the most German Americans in its population, but it always had the highest percentage. And, of course, uh, a lot of the things that they did are part of our culture today. They were very good at education, at good, honest politics. <laughs> and uh, good government. And, uh, but there were other important ethnic groups as well. The Poles constituted a large number of our ethnic contingent. Many of them settled up in the area north and uh, west of Green Bay, Palas uh, Pulaski, uh, and so on. One day I was driving up in that part of the state <clears throat> down some of the back roads. My students and I would call that rubbernecking, looking for old buildings. And we came upon this uh, very interesting sign. Has anybody ever had a polka dill pickle? I don't know if they make them anymore. I haven't seen them on the shelves. But then I found this to be of interest on uh, one of my trips up to northern Wisconsin, it was a sign that hung on the main street of a bank. Can everybody hear me all right? 
uh, of Ashland, Wisconsin. And it says in seven different languages, more or less, we will lend you money to improve your land, or improve your homestead. And it's written in, oh boy, Polish, German, Russian, Finnish. Um, I'm not sure what some of the other languages are. But it indicates the, um, the cultural diversity that we have in our state. And I think that really helps make Wisconsin to be a special place to live. Not only do we have a very attractive landscape, we don't have the mountains and the oceans like other parts of the country, but we have what I always like to call the best of the middle ground. And you can go up and find festivals occurring like Fête de Mai down in Stoughton, or Belgian Days up in um, Southern Door County, centered around the community of Brussels, a number of our place names have taken on old world uh, origins. Places like Frog Station and uh, Moose Jaw Junction, if any of you have ever been to those places? There, there are such places in Wisconsin. <laughs> Frog Station is right on the southern Kiwani County line. The, the uh, shot at the lower right is of one of the folk fairs that's held annually in Milwaukee um, in the arena. I don't know where they hold it now. I haven't been there for a while. But it's usually held around Thanksgiving time. And a lot of people dressed up in their native costume and get together to portray their crafts and foods and dress and cultural habits and so on. Um, and you can see all these things with us today. You know, I heard somebody advertising Wisconsin Public Radio the other day, and they said, I'm proud I live in Wisconsin. I even know what a bratwurst is. You can go down to Mississippi or Arkansas, I suppose, and not many people would know. And our music. You know, a lot of the great polka bands came from Kiwani County in the big Bohemian settlement there. And uh, some rather unusual ethnic groups, white Russians, who have this church up near Cornucopia, right up by Lake Superior. And on the left, that postcard is from an area settled primarily by Bohemians, um, Hagen, Wisconsin. And you can see that all these ladies are decked out in their native costume. And one of those infamous Bohemian musicians is standing in the back with his uh, I guess it's a baritone or maybe a French horn. And they're about to embark on a parade, probably for some particular religious holiday. And of course, Wisconsin, everybody knows Wisconsin because of the Packers, but they probably also know us uh, because of the beer that's been brewed and is being brewed here. Um, more festivals. Um, in my wife's hometown of Princeton, um, <clears throat> the Lutheran Church would have a, a sermon in German. Was it every third Sunday of the month, Betsy, or every month at least, something like that. So we have clung to some of these traits in many subtle ways. It shaped our culture, who we are as Wisconsinites. Well. We love our farms and our attractive farmsteads and our rural countryside, especially if it's unspoiled. Well, many immigrants came to Wisconsin, like my ancestors. They were virtually penniless, hoping to make it big in the new world where they could have their own piece of land. And they had dreams of uh, big crops. This is one of those. There are a whole series of postcards with these exaggerated farming scenes on them. Uh, that's not for real. But those are sure big apples. I wonder if they're honey crisp. <laughs> Instead, especially if they went into the cutover area where they were lured by an immigration bureau and literature that was sent abroad to many Norwegian countries, they ended up with a homestead on a parcel of land that probably looked something like this. Can you imagine getting off the boat, practically penniless, maybe you've got a couple of kids, 
winter's coming on, you don't have a house to live in. You don't have any real food to eat unless you've got relatives or friends nearby down the road. <clears throat> I'll tell you, our ancestors ch faced some formidable challenges. And um, what they had to do to get by for the first winter was to erect a, a crude, usually log, building, if there were enough logs left, uh, like this one. Uh, this was in a Polish region up near Thorpe, Wisconsin. As you can see, there's nothing fancy about this dwelling. This is an ordinary, humble, first-generation vernacular or folk architecture uh, type of building. Probably had a dirt floor, um, one door, two windows, and that was about it. I'd go crazy spending a winter, you know, sealed up in something like that. Here's another shot of what some of those very primitive initial dwellings would probably have looked like. Well, there are a lot of interesting accounts that geographers and historians and others have written about what life was like back in those times. And this is what one of my favorite authors wrote. <laughs> and he said, the makeshift dwellings must have been amusing sites. <clears throat> One Norwegian family lived in a haystack for three months, while others huddled together in crude brush shelters hastily put together. Well, the immigrants brought with them a lot of old world building techniques. If a man was an apprentice for seven years, I think it was back in Europe, he just didn't adapt the new Yankee balloon frame building method immediately. He would stick to the old-fashioned ways. And here we see some examples of old world architecture, styles, materials. The gentleman, <laughs> thanks Winnie. The gentleman on the left is hewing a log. And uh, that's kind of fun to do. Uh, I took 20 years to restore a tiny log cabin back home in North County, but uh, we bought the building and took it down and found out from the homestead records that it only had two doors, and there were three doors in the building because they had cut down one of the windows to make a new doorway. So we had to um, hew the logs to make the finish look, you know, like the traditional finish. And the way that was done was they would snap a chalk line across the top of the log, which was held in place on two perpendicular logs by these iron log dogs. <clears throat> then a, a carpenter or joiner or Zimmerman or Tischler, they were called in German, would come along with a felling ax and score the log about every 16 inches. Then a skilled broad axeman, notice this had a curved handle so he wouldn't skin his knuckles, would come along and flake off the big pieces of log between the score marks. Well, this is a real interesting method of construction. It's called stovewood. I spent a lot of time looking for different stovewood buildings um, all over much of the Midwest, and I found that most of them were in Wisconsin, although there are a lot in Upper Michigan, where it was known as the poor man's or depression architecture because one man way out in the boondocks in an isolated area like Moose Jaw Junction or some way out in the woods somewhere where his homestead claim was could build like this. He didn't have to lift the big heavy logs, especially the ones that run all the way across the top of the window and door, which could really be heavy. Um, he would uh, instead cut it up into short lengths and lay each stovewood sized length up in a bed of wet lime mortar. Now this made for a very good wall in many respects. I could never figure out why it didn't become more popular because it's well insulated. The only problem was how do you turn the corner? Well, there are various interesting techniques for how they discovered how to do this. Over in Ozaki County, in the northern part of Sheboygan County, there's a big settlement of Luxembourgers. And of course, Luxembourg, like uh, the Belgians and m much of Denmark, are low countries. There's not a lot of timber there. So their traditional building technique was masonry. 
brick and or masonry like we see here. Here we see a, an interesting, boy, this would be a great site for a, a, hell, a Halloween party to scare the kids with. <clears throat> well, we would look for these buildings and photograph them and, and measure them up and document them. Here's another interesting log construction technique, vertical logs. And look at the notching. Look at the workmanship on that building. That was from a Finnish sauna up in Olu Township in Bayfield County, which in the past, the, where in the past the predominant uh, population was Finnish. But that's called a box notch. And each log is carefully fitted over the one beneath it. The bottom side of each log is hollowed out in a concave fashion to fit precisely over the naturally rounded surface of the log immediately beneath it. Now the Finns had a special handmade tool, usually made by a local blacksmith. It was like a pair of dividers, they called them a vado, to, to inscribe a line as to just how much they could hew off of a, a log to make for that tight fit. Well, buildings with this type of notch weren't very popular, actually. They didn't build a lot of them because they knew that in the future, they would probably side over the log building with clapboard siding or vertical board and batten siding to make it look like the, the houses their yanking, their yanking neighbors had, had uh, lived in just down the road. So they'd have to saw those corner notches off. And that wouldn't add to the stability of the building. We can tell a lot from buildings. We can read them like a book, actually, if we know what to look for. Now, if we look at various ethnic groups, we know that the Yankees were among the first, along with the French and French Canadians, to populate our neck of the woods, our part of the country. Many of the Yankees were from New York. And those from New York, some of them learned of a masonry building technique called cobblestone, which we see in the lower right. And that consisted, especially over in the Kettle Moraine country where there was a lot of glacial terrain and you could find these, these, uh, these uh, stones that had been rolled around, they'd lay them up to make a wall. They also brought certain styles of architecture from the east, Italianate, Greek Revival, you can always tell an old building if it has these uh, eave turn-ins, like right here. If they do, they probably date back about to the time of the Civil War. Uh, this house, the Sanborn House, stood in Kenosha County. And uh, it was later moved to Old World, Wisconsin, because it was laying vacant for a number of years. And like all flesh, it would have fallen into ruin. So it was moved to Old World, and here it sits in its new... How many of you have been to Old World, Wisconsin? <laughs> um, it's a real treasure. It's a wonderful amenity for Wisconsin in a very special place. Well, here we see the Sanborn House fully restored along with this barn. Now, New Yorkers brought some barn building traditions that had originated in England. And that was for mainly grain barns before the days of dairying here in Wisconsin. The grain barns would sit flat on the ground because they didn't have to shelter cattle. And they would have these double doors which would swing to the side on each of the lateral or long sides of the barn. And because they threshed in the barn, they would use that central threshing bay, most of the old barns had, had three spaces or bays, one on each side, one to store the grain in, one for the grain bins for the uh, flailed grain, and then the central bay was for flailing. They would open these doors on each end so as to create a kind of venturi effect, so that when they threshed the grain, uh, which was placed on a big canvas on the floor, they could then separate the wheat from the chaff, throw it up in the air, and the breeze going through the barn would blow away the chaff. Then they would pour the rest into a grain bin, maybe take some home to um, use for flour or to feed some of the animals. 
or they would bring it down to sell it to a mill. So, the Yankees. Well, not long after the Yankees came, the Germans came. The first German settlement in Wisconsin was in 1839 over in Milwaukee, where a group of Pomeranians, or Pomerans, as they would say in Deutschland, Germany, um, Northeast Germany, they settled there and then spread outward. There's a large concentration of them in Dodge County, Sheboygan County, Washington County, and they continued to build in the building tradition from their homeland. Now that part of Europe um, was intensively cultivated and there was a lot of warfare and a lot of fires. There wasn't much timber and the ordinary person couldn't afford to build an all wood house. So they devised a different building method which the Germans call the Fachwerk or the local Germans over in Dodge County call it Deutsche Werbung, whereas they just have a framework of timber, and all of these timbers are mortised and tenoned together, and then they're infilled with a nogging of either, um, they used clay at first, but that didn't last for too many years. Then they would infill with brick. Now these are all shots taken at Old World of Wisconsin. Here we see a very interesting, very early uh, German dwelling. It has one big heating unit which serves to smoke meat and fish, bake bread, heat the house, again because of the wood shortage situation. You can see that one central chimney. And in the back, you can see this stable. Maybe you can just make out the overhang. That's a typical Pomeranian stable. If you go looking at um, German books about their old architecture, uh, you can make some interesting comparisons. But this barn is really special. See how the outward doors are, are folded open? And it even has a thatched roof. Now, I've never, I've never found a building with a thatched roof. <coughs> but a diary was found by some of the staff at Old World, Wisconsin, which read that a particular farmer had gone out around the end of November to repair the thatching in his roof. They must have had a big storm. And later we found what we figured out were thatching poles. Those were timbers that ran transversely on top of the rafters. You know, all of this thatching is tied on with a cord before, before the days of nylon cord. So the wind would tend to move this around and the temperature would cause some shifting and so on. And if it was tied just to a beam that was squared on the bottom with 90 degree corners, you can be sure it would cut through uh, that cord pretty quickly. So what they would do is chamfer around the corners to help prevent that. Here we see a really nice farmstead, the Kepsel farm built by a farmer and a, a carpenter. Uh, that's one of the nicer spots at Old World. They've got animals and geese and pigs and so on to add a nice feeling of human scale. They bought these oxen from Old Sturbridge Village and they were quite a rare breed. Oxen used to be common, but then they, the uh, farmers shifted over to horses. And the gardens too, they've done a lot of research for the gardens. You know, what did, what did Germans grow anyway besides hops and cabbage and um, squash and beans and that kind of stuff. There's a good book out about that. Okay. <clears throat> then we come to the Norwegians. Uh, another prominent ethnic group in Wisconsin. Now, this building is, at, is the oldest building at Old World. Would you believe there were 23 people who stayed here over the winter? One family got here and they contacted all their brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and cousins and in-laws. And 23 of them came over and they all slept in this at one time. <laughs> now, now, can you imagine what it would be like if somebody snored real loud? Or if you, <laughs> if you had to get up in the middle of the night and try to avoid stepping on someone? But that is a fact, 23 people. Now, the two buildings in the upper right are interesting as well because 
the building on the very upper right corner, uh, the Norwegians call a Saval house. They lived downstairs and they kept their treasures and food and grain upstairs, and it was usually reached by a, by a ladder. But um, in the Norwegian Folk Museum on an island off the coast of Oslo, there's a twin cousin. So we can see that people just didn't forget about, you know, how to build things or what to build or how they should be used. They kept continuing the old ways, and especially if there was a large enclave of Norwegians or Germans. The first Norwegians came mostly into the um, um, south central part of Wisconsin and then moved westward into Viroqua and places like that. And here we see uh, some examples of Polish architecture. Uh, an example of an early Polish building is very hard to find. There were a lot of Polanders that came to Wisconsin, but many of them settled mostly on the south side of Milwaukee and in other urban centers. Now, the building on the upper right is especially interesting. It's the old Michikowski General Store and Saloon up at Jennings, Wisconsin. This was the center of a big lumbering area, so there were a lot of lumberjacks that would come into town. You've all heard stories about how they blow their <laughs> paychecks uh, over the weekend. And uh, it's, again, an interesting stovewood technique. Now, my daughter is standing next to a barn that, unfortunately, has been left to fall into disrepair back in Bailey's Harbor. Here is a farm, the old Bukowski farm, that has some interesting Polish uh, traditional building techniques, um, like a, a huge cellar for storing potatoes, raised planter beds, a ladder to get up to the second floor, and over here is another Polish farm over in, uh, I forget what county, uh, somewhere north of Green Bay. But the Poles were an important ethnic group. Then we have some lesser known ethnic groups. I never knew that there was a Jewish colony over at Arpen in Wood County. There's not much left of it anymore, but uh, it was quite a settlement in a few years prior to World War I. And over in um, Lincoln County, there's another interesting settlement of Estonians and uh, Lithuanians. And this church, according to a good friend of mine, professor at University of Minnesota Duluth, who is of um, Estonian ancestry, that was the first Estonian Lutheran church in America. When we found it, though, it was in pretty sad shape. It had been badly vandalized, and the cemetery, which was right around the church, had been grown up. You could hardly find some of the tombstones. And then way up north, by Lake Superior, is this nice little Russian Orthodox church with one of the domed steeples, just like back in the old days of Russia. And the cemetery nearby has this symbolic feature <clears throat> one time my brother, one of my brothers and I took a trip to Russia and I found out that on a house, this angular member of this uh, Russian Orthodox cross should always point to the north. Well, there are many other groups that I don't have time to get into. The Danes. The Belgians, they were a very prominent group. Wisconsin had the largest settlement in America of Walloon Belgians, French-speaking Belgians. And Swiss, not just in New Glarus, but over in Sauk County, there's a large settlement of, of German-speaking Swiss. Of course, Norwegians are all over the place. This is over near Coon Valley. Often the Norwegians would put a layer of uh, calcinite, paint the exterior of their buildings to make them look a little nicer, I guess. And it would help preserve the wood. Here's another one of those big stone dwellings over in uh, Ozaki County, falling apart. I don't know what, I don't know what, uh, can't remember what the nationality of that building was. But here's another Norwegian log structure. Now there's one interesting detail 
that'll always help you spot <coughs> a building it's of, if it's of Norwegian ancestry. Because a number of Norwegians had sod roofs initially. If you look at their homestead papers, which describe how they, what they had to do to improve their land, they would put in certain details about the dwelling. Now, if you look under the roof, you can see these logs. They're called purlins. Now, why would they reinforce the rafters with those purlins? Well, the reason apparently was because that heavy sod, which was put on a thick layer of birch bark to make it more waterproof, if it rained, would get really heavy. So that's an interesting detail. Another interesting detail about most of the Nordic, uh, which would now include the, the Finns, is that the logs go all the way up to the top of the gable peak. Can't remember if they did on this building or not. Probably not. Well, <clears throat> these ingenious builders never had computers or slide rules. I did meet a few old timers when I was starting to do this kind of work. And boy, they were sure interesting. Uh, and I taped a couple of them. They had a lot of good stories to tell. One old timer up near Abbotsford uh, was like 90 years old. He was a master barn builder. And he said, well, a master barn builder never does any of the work. He just walks around and swears at everybody and, you know, marks, <laughs> marks where the tenant should be cut. And I asked him, well, which barn or what, what are you most proud of? You had a pretty long career. And he said, well, you know, I never lost a man on the job. Because building a barn could be really dangerous. And especially if some of these young guys were out on a... <laughs> on a Friday night and had, you know, a snoot full and were climbing up around on the, on the rafters and slipped. That could be pretty dangerous. I suppose many of you are getting ready now with your ice shanties. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty elaborate one. People took shelter virtually any way they could, even in railroad boxcars, if there was one nearby that they could get into. See the chimney sticking out? And this is a real interesting building. It was built by a man from my hometown, August Zahn, um, an old German woodcarver. His grandson was one of my best friends. But he built this house at Bailey's Harbor and festooned it with his carvings. Now, if you have one of these carvings, you are probably quite wealthy because the Kohler Art Museum had, a, had a, um, an exhibit of his carvings. and. Uh, People were buying them for thousands of dollars. He had a particular technique, and his wife would paint them. She made black paint from soot from their stove, wood stove. Well, you know what's happening to this legacy. I think old buildings, not every one, but old buildings are important. They're just as important, or just about as important depending on how you look at it, as fresh air, abundant clean water, enough healthy food, et cetera, et cetera. But yet far too many are obsolete. Farmers just can't afford to pay taxes on them, much less put a new roof on. You could practically build a new metal barn for the cost it would be to re-roof a big gambrel roof barn, which would be dangerous work. So many are being demolished. Many are just falling into disrepair. We often read of a barn fire because of the hay being stored damp and it causes, um, what is it called, infernal combustion. So if we don't, you know, pay a little more attention to what we have in our environment to foster a better life for our grandkids, we don't want to end up with something like this off of the cover of a holiday, <laughs> holiday in directory. So one saving grace, in part, is uh, Old World Wisconsin. It's one of our state's real treasures. If you haven't been there, I would encourage you to find a nice day, pack a picnic lunch, bring along a bottle of wine, and spend the day. Um, at the lower right is my son. He's now 
is it 48 now, Betsy? 48 years old, anyway. Um, I hope he's developed a good land ethic um, because that's very important for our future and especially our kids and really especially for our grandchildren. And part of that future should be historic buildings. And that, that's it. Thank you. I'm just going to say thank you very much, Bill. That's very interesting. Now you're at the mercy of the troops. I better be careful. <laughs> architecture books that are written by university professors, um, and I think this is continuing, but um, the first one I um, read or looked at was on the university buildings, the uh, construction of the barns and uh, things like that, and the one barn that was actually where the symphony orchestra would perform because of the acoustics in the barn and things like that. Um, are you a part, were you a part of any of those vernacular, the books? I, and I remember them because it was vernacular at architecture and I didn't know what it meant at the time. Could you repeat that for sure? Well, the question was about books published on vernacular architecture from the university. From the university. Well, one of my colleagues was Arnie Allenen. That's a good Finnish name. A good Finnish lad from northern Minnesota and a good friend. Uh, he and I have worked on a lot of projects um, um, as consultants to the National Park Service for the Apostolanos National Lakeshore and for Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. And uh, he also wrote a nice summary um, uh, of the Ag School, the historic buildings in it and so on. Um, but Arnie is a, a very prolific, a good colleague and a very prolific author. Um, those were very interesting projects because we had to go, after the uh, National Park Service had <clears throat> bought up the land uh, for the islands, for the National Lakeshore, they tore all the buildings down. And then later they realized people were asking, hey, what about the history of this area? And people lived on the islands. There are old cemeteries out there. We would go probing with welding rods to find foundations in the, in the uh, apple orchards and where lilacs were growing trying to read the landscape and, and, and working with an archaeologist from, uh, from um, University at Houghton uh, and spend time out on the islands. There were old cars out in the woods with trees growing up through them and a big quarry on Basswood Island with the huge stone blocks all marked and waiting to be shipped out. And we interviewed um, in Bayfield some of the old fishermen who remember the storms and the fishermen who went out and, and didn't make it back. And there was a colony on Sand Island, and they would send their kids to school in Bayfield. <laughs> and we had a school on the island. My husband and I worked for the volunteer, volunteered for the um, park service for three summers on Sand Island. And um, there was one of those old cars there, which they would not move, which they also did not um, keep safe. It's yeah. kind of deteriorating. Yeah. But um, the, but you could see where the foundation of the school was. Um, well, it's a very interesting place, and some early air photographs help locate buildings and old postcards. I like to collect old postcards. There's some good old postcards of of uh, of places on the island. There were a couple of resorts, maybe one on Sand Island. And then at Sleeping Bear Dunes, boy, that was really interesting. There was an old lighthouse uh, and Coast Guard station at Sleeping Bear Dunes, and we, climbed, we managed to climb up in the tower and look down, and the, the lighthouse building had a slate roof, and people were dropping rocks from it and <clears throat> smashing through the slate roof. But um, I think the Park Service, you know, got its hands full, never has enough money. A lot of good people working for it. They, do a, the best job they can. <clears throat> Mary, did you have a question? Oh, yeah. One of the things that 
that I find interesting is driving from Madison up to Sauk City and beyond with the various type of, and I don't remember now just what it is, stack and block? Block and stack. Block and stack. Right. Do you do any uh, research on those buildings? I did. I had a graduate student uh, who was quite interested in that building technique. And she <laughs> talked with um, a retired doctor who lived out by Badger Ordnance, a Dr. Kenji. I think he was an anesthesiologist. Anyway, he was uh, apparently quite wealthy, but very frugal. But his grandfather was a mason. And we'd go out and talk with him and, and go into his little apartment. And one, I remember one time I sat down on the bed and kaplunk. I thought, what's underneath this? And he said, oh, I got a box of canned goods from the dump, and they didn't have any labels on. So <laughs> somebody was throwing them out. But uh, it's called block and stack. And um, there's nothing quite like it back in Switzerland. They're, they're all German-speaking Swiss. Um, at least I've never seen anything quite like that over there. Switzerland is such a beautiful country. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I'm wondering, can vernacular architecture be equated with building without an architect? I'm not sure. Definitely. Um, Most definitely, yes. Um, one definition of vernacular or folk architecture is that they're ordinary buildings, and they're built by people who haven't been formally trained. You know, they didn't go to school and get a degree in architecture. They just learned by an apprenticeship system or working with somebody that was a good teacher, knew what he was doing. <coughs> Marge, did you have a question? Not really, no, but I was remembering my um, mom and dad built 30 some houses. 30? 30 some, since 1940. Oh my <laughs> it seems like the first one that they built, they had ordered it from the Sears Rosa Company. Yes. <laughs> yeah, did they sell? Yes, right. they, had, <clears throat> yeah. they had catalogs for houses and barns. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And did then um, one of the barns that they had built, um, I guess my dad was able to get shell cases from the Second World War. Really? You know what they are? Oh, yeah. And they had U.S. Army on them and a yeah. number. And the fellow who ended up buying this property, he just couldn't figure out where they had came from because, you know, <laughs> the words were still on and they used it for the ceiling of this uh, barn here now. And so, and so I made two different scrapbooks of all the houses that my mother and dad built. So. <laughs> my oldest brother followed in our family line. He was quite a carpenter. And uh, when he couldn't work anymore, one of his clients uh, took him around, and they together went to all the buildings that he ever built. And his friend photographed them and gave him an album uh, of those photos, which was nice. And we're going to go in the car, and we're going to go around and take a picture of all these houses, because she was, I think, in her 70s at that point, you know, and I figured <laughs> That's a lot. we haven't done get up-to-date pictures of all these, you know. Mm. Did you have a question? Yeah, I, I had a friend who lived on the near west side of Madison in, I, I suppose, a vernacular house. The, uh, the, the main a beam in the, it was a small house, the main beam <coughs> in the basement was a railroad uh, rail. Really? And it was because the standard rail was 20 feet long and the house was 20 feet long because <laughs> that, and it was a, you know, those rails are heavy and they're strong. People were very frugal and very good at recycling. You can probably remember during war, war, World War II recycling tin foil and bacon grease and what else was it? Newspapers? The Boy Scouts would collect newspapers. Eleanor, did you have a question? I have a question. <laughs> yeah. Is right. there some way that we can explore and find old buildings? Um, kind of like a treasure hunt or something like that? Is there 
a directory somewhere, or do you have information, GPS <coughs> points? Or? Well, um, that's a good question. Well, down most any back road out in the country, you can find something. But if you have um, an early plat map, that can, they often show where the buildings are with a little black square. That can be helpful. And um, the first one of aerial photographs for Wisconsin was taken in the 1930s. That can be real helpful. And um, the number one rule, which I always caution my students, we would go out in three different cars as three teams doing this field work for about 10 summers. I always caution, caution them. You never enter a farm, even though it's an abandoned one that looks interesting because it has all these old washing machines and cars out in front. Those are often some of the most interesting. You always get permission. But there are hazards that you have to be careful of when you're doing field work. There are electric fences, poison ivy, <coughs> mad dogs, raging bulls, rusty nails. You can break through a, into a well that might have gotten grown over. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun, but you have to be careful. <coughs> yes. Yes, were, you, were you ever asked to consult about lighthouses? Oh yes, I just <laughs> I just finished a cultural landscape report for the Cana Island Lighthouse, which I worked on day and night practically for. Betsy <laughs> almost divorced me for several months, but that was really interesting because I had access to all the old lighthouse keepers' logs. They would, they would log the weather every day, and you could find stories about shipwrecks, how they would notify the, the Coast Guard. There used to be a Coast Guard station right across the bay in Bailey's Harbor to go out and rescue uh, or help rescue people if the ship was in distress. Very interesting. Yes? Ethnically also, like, were, were they built according to different cultures <coughs> uh, as far as their structure? No. Uh, the government had certain standards. And uh, if you look around at lighthouses, there are more lighthouses in Door County back home than any other county in America, I've been told. But they tend to have a very similar um, appearance. I don't know if you've ever gone up to the one at Rock Island. It was abandoned for many years way on the northern tip. That was the first lighthouse built in Wisconsin, I think in 1839. And um, one of my former students was the caretaker there for a couple of summers. She lived there with her kids who were off from school during the summer. But that's a real interesting place. But Cana Island Light is said to be the most photographed lighthouse in Wisconsin, or maybe the most painted lighthouse. The water used to be so high at times I can remember that there was no causeway going over. You had to roll up your pants and take off your shoes and wade over. Yes, sir. Bill, one of your former students here, Paul. Paul, oh, hey, good to see you, Paul. Uh, you too. Uh, I just want to say, I, Bill hired me between my sophomore and junior years in landscape architecture. I spent the summer in Bayfield, Wisconsin, uh, documenting every building, Good. every outhouse, <laughs> every barn, <coughs> shed in Bayfield as to what was the color, uh, what was the style, what was the rough shape, what was the construction technique. Uh, this was for the, uh, I think, the, the Lakeshore? Uh, National Lakeshore? National Lakeshore oh, uh, good. project. But what a coming of age experience it was for me. Um, I've continued in landscape architecture and preservation especially. So well, good luck to you, Paul. <laughs> used to be fun to go up north. I first joined the faculty in 1964, and uh, um, as you may remember, times things were quite different then. But on these field trips up north, um, 
the students would sometimes get pretty wild. And we'd <laughs> sit around the campfire at night, and uh, I don't know what they were smoking, but it smelled like burning leaves. <laughs> yes? Uh, Bill, could you tell us what the present state of preservation is? We have one of your students talking about his uh, time in doing, doing that detailed work. Is that still being done? What, what is going on right now in terms of the vernacular <coughs> architecture in the state of Wisconsin? Well, as you know, we have an excellent state historical society. <coughs> Excuse me. And they have a, a wonderful um, iconographic uh, and uh, collection of all kinds of important things. Uh, they also have a preservation division, which has some good people in it. Uh, Jim, um, what's his name? Just wrote a book about Dra <laughs> Jim Drager about um, Wisconsin country bars. Um, I don't think they send people out in the field. I, I haven't kept up with them like I should. Old World, though, is always looking for uh, new buildings if they can afford them. There is an Old World Foundation, which has been very good and very active. They hold these occasional dinners, um, ethnic dinners, Swedish dinners, Norwegian dinners. There's a Scottish one coming up um, in um, early December. But um, the problem is, um, I think our department is endangered because of the funding problem. I've heard a lot of rumors about, we have a very nice dean and she's very smart, but in the ag school, everyone's a scientist practically, and they can bring in all these big research dollars from genetics and biophysics and so on, and landscape architecture, that, you know, that, that's just a quality of life thing. So um, I hope that doesn't happen, but uh, I've heard rumors uh, about the impending demise <laughs> of our department, which would be, um, I think, a, a real shame. Because people in our department have gone out, some really good students, like Mrs. Emma, Mrs. Emikowski's daughter, and done very well, very well. One of them even ran against uh, Herb Cole in a Senate race. He started, um, uh, what's that Badger Boys thing up by New Holstein? Um, Rawhide. Others have become publishers, Main Street managers. Um, one of them is one is the leading golf course design build architect in the in the country. A kid from uh, um, New Glarus. Good kid. His office is out in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, Bill, we thank you for all your efforts and your career in terms of um, what you're able to share with us today on um, the vernacular architecture, uh, your tribute to your uh, career, your many years of doing this, um, and an appreciative audience of all of your work. So would you um, join me in uh, paying tribute to Bill? Yes. Thanks.